whilst they're getting there, let me just tell you this. Um, my day job at the uh, Homes and Communities Agency is delivery on the ground in the peninsula. But I'm really here today speaking to you because after pushing and pushing for some time, I've just been given the opportunity to take on and board a national role to promote and support the off-site uh, industry in terms of housing delivery, not only on projects and programs that we're directly involved in ourselves, but also in terms of all of our activities, funding other partners to actually deliver housing. Where does that interest come from? This isn't a fantastic picture, but um, this is very similar to a home, the home of my best friend when I was 10, living in Taunton. Um, he lived in a prefabricated house on Hallway Road. Uh, they've been redeveloped now. But I was absolutely fascinated by this. It was very different to the house I was in. It was warm and cozy, but it was clearly manufactured in a different way. And that interest in prefabrication, off-site manufacture, has stuck with me. And I'm here today not quite sure why we haven't made huge advances in the use of off-site manufacture within UK housing. Um, I've been with the HCA for four years. In that time, I've seen the public interest in housing issues just grow enormously. It's driven by what is a dysfunctional uh, supply of housing in the UK. 2015 Ipsos Mori poll showed that the public concern about housing issues was the highest it had been for 40 years, since the 1970s. And some of you may have seen that just a couple of weeks ago, the Observer had an eight-page supplement on the housing crisis, and the backbone of that coverage was all about the, the public interest in housing. Now, some of the statistics from that report really give you an understanding of where we stand in the UK. 69% of Britons feel that a housing crisis exists. If you take out those people who said they didn't know, it rises to 81%, so real concern. 69% of young British renters want to buy their own home, but of those, 71% said they thought it would be impossible unless they could get financial support from their families. 67% of Britons support building homes on brownfield land, but only 9% support building on the green belt. And if you read all the results in that survey, what you saw was that for a lot of people out there on the streets, the solutions that they want to see to the housing crisis is actually all about uh, restrictions, stop foreign buyers being able to buy properties, reduce the ability or increase the taxes on second home ownership. There was very little public interest or support in ramping up supply. And to put those um, responses in context, when people were asked what were the three most important issues to them, to me it's a bit disappointing that housing comes fifth. Immigration though is the number one issue and you can see immediately that the links between levels of immigration in the country and the pressure that puts on the housing supply, they're very strong. So I don't know whether some people were thinking immigration is all about the housing problem, but um, I would have really liked to see housing higher in that list. The UK housing market is dysfunctional. Um, when Mark Carney became the governor of the Bank of England, within a couple of weeks, he made quite a strong statement saying that it was dysfunctional and he couldn't understand how we failed to supply uh, as many houses as uh, he'd seen being produced in Canada. Um, to me, you know, the absolute um, headline about that, that dysfunction is that of all the money government spends directly on housing, 95% of it is being spent on housing benefit, effectively supporting people to pay their rent. Um, that's 25 billion pounds a year. And I'm gonna tell you in a minute about some of the resources that the government has committed to increasing supply of housing but put it in that context, if we could only use some of that funding to increase affordability, increase supply, 
and over time reduce the housing benefit. I, I wonder whether it could be self-financing. The current government has made a very, very ambitious commitment to boost housing supply. It's a headline figure. It wants a one million new homes in England by March 2021. It wants to double the number of first-time buyers. It has significant proposals to devolve greater spending and powers to local areas. And once again, it wants to see those resources spent on boosting housing supply. There has been a slow but building pressure within government to really accelerate the, the release of public land. That's both local authority owned land and government assets themselves. And it has certainly now tasked the Homes and Communities Agency to really drive delivery of new housing. All those policies taken together, they, they were backed in the autumn by a 20 billion pound uh, spending review settlement but a very, very clear increased scrutiny from government to see that we actually meet the targets. If you translate those targets to what we're being asked to deliver, I can tell you that in terms of the direct supply of housing that we would have an involvement in, whether on projects or land that we own or funding, we're being expected by government to ramp up our activity by five times what we've ever achieved in the life of the HCA. So it is a very, very challenging ask. 36,000 new homes are expected to be delivered on land that we already own. 30,000 homes are expected to be delivered on land coming to the HCA from other government departments. We have a 1.2 billion budget committed for us to go out and source new land to deliver starter homes. Quite a change in recent years is the government has asked us to directly commission housing and for us to take more direct risk in taking forward developments, procuring houses to our own order um, and uh, delivering them on, on sites we own and control. We're just about to announce a three billion pound loan fund to be made available to uh, developers uh, to help them bring forward projects, uh, particularly with an emphasis on housing schemes that may have been stalled. And the government uh, has just uh, released the prospectus for the new affordable housing programme, £4.7 billion pounds in that, um, a very strong emphasis in there on the delivery of shared ownership housing. This is my favourite <laughs> diagram of any I've ever seen relating to UK housing supply. Actually, this is, this is housing supply in England. Uh, many of you will have seen this many times before, but um, I, just want to, I just want to highlight a couple of things. The green is local authority-led housing delivery, and that took off in significant um, pace after the end of the Second World War with major slum clearance, um, emergency house building programs, lots of pre prefabricated homes uh, being built, compulsory purchase powers and all sorts of tools to aid delivery. The blue is supplied by all of the private sector. That includes our volume house builders, SMEs, custom builders. Um, and the message you can take from this diagram is that at best, we can expect the private sector to deliver about 150,000 homes in England a year. It varies, it goes up and down, but I'm afraid it's very difficult to see that um, significantly increasing beyond that figure. The red is the take up of delivery of housing by what we call registered providers. You would probably think of them as housing associations. So it's affordable housing delivery often supported by government funding. That rises from the 1980s when the uh, Thatcher-led government at the time really brought in restrictions to actually stop local authorities from building new housing. Um, and you see the kind of uh, fall in LA supply and rise in um, uh, some delivery through housing associations. Now, what I really wanted to use this diagram to do was to 
to take the government uh, objective of getting to a million homes by 2021, look at the realistic level of supply that can be achieved through the private sector, through our activities with uh, registered providers um, taken this year, and just do the simple metric of the growth that we need to see to get to that target. And all I would draw your attention to is the steepness of the curve. We're looking at a level of increased supply, which is absolutely consistent with what we needed to do immediately after the war. Uh, a bomb-damaged, war-ravaged country and a government that actually adopted emergency measures to increase supply. So we're in that territory, whatever way you look at it. Uh, car manufacture was mentioned, and I just can't understand some of the differences between the growth in technology between our car manufacturers and our housing providers. Car manufacture in the 1920s, car manufacture in the 2000s, and what I think any of us can recognize is modern car manufacture has standardization of the base model with all sorts of ability to customize it to customers' requirements. By comparison, housing construction in the 1920s, to me, it doesn't necessarily look that different in the 2000s. But I do know enough, enough about house building to realize that there is an inordinate amount of productivity changes that have taken place. A lot of our volume house builders use a significant amount of, uh, of off-site manufactured components, window units, um, you know, stud partitions, uh, pre-assembled rafter assemblies. I know it's all happening, but if I go back to our delivery of our affordable housing program last year, it was hugely impacted by the weather. We really struggled to make the numbers at the end of the day, simply because of adverse weather conditions. I just want to share two quite opposing views. Um, this first one is from Kate Barker, who you will recall was the author of the Barker Review of the Supply of Housing in 2004. And um, she says, I think the use of modular construction is a red herring. It's not really part of the solution. By comparison, Jeremy Gint, who's the Director of Regeneration at Barking and Dagenham, he says, we've, we've got to engage uh, in the greater use of off-site manufacture to, to produce the numbers that we need to produce. And what I've seen is off-site manufacture is definitely gaining uh, huge uh, um, impact, particularly in urban centers and particularly in London. There are a couple of really, really um, uh, impressive looking changes that um, are really gonna boost the sector. Legal in general, household name, controller of a huge uh, amount of uh, investment funds. They have invested in a 55 million off-site manufacturing facility in Leeds. I understand the first houses are coming off the line this, uh, sorry, in June. Um, capacity for three to four and a half thousand flats per year. And they are saying that they have a, uh, an investment program of 7.9 billion earmarked for investment in housing and infrastructure and they are going to use those facilities to drive their own supply. The Department of Business, Innovation and Skills gave a grant of 22 million to support uh, a major new off-site uh, factory in Hartlepool, has a capacity for 10,000 homes per year, and it's part of a consortium of 22 members, including housing associations, who are guaranteeing a level of supply. Um, and what's interesting with just these two examples is the investments are, are taking place up north and a lot of the supply inevitably is going to come down and provide the market in the south. So an interesting aspect of the north-south divide. Um, I just want to show you a couple of examples. Some of these, you know, are quite long-standing. The first one, Peabody Trust, um, dates back to 1999. Um, some comments were made by Chris about, you know, the... The, the benefits of off-site manufacture. Um, and a few things are absolutely clear. Speed of delivery ramps up incredibly. 
The, the 30 homes for the BP Body Trust absolutely completed within a six month construction period. The, the building on the right, which is a, 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 a timber modular uh, apartment building, the actual structure was completed in 27 working days. This to me is a, is a lovely example of how um, we're still at quite an early stage in the use of modular construction in the UK housing uh, sector. Um, the Manningham, Manningham site in, in Bradford is, is a large regeneration site. Um, the, uh, the In Communities Housing Association has committed to build six, just six, modular constructed homes. And they're working with, I, I think you pronounce it, Icroning from Holland. Um, and when you look at what Icroning do in their own country and in Europe, they supply hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of absolutely beautiful modular homes. So um, we are bringing in technology uh, to a large part from abroad, and we're, we're a babe in arms compared to what um, our European colleagues are already doing. This urban splash project in Manchester looks really exciting to me. I mean, this is modular construction, but what it seems to be doing is really appealing extremely well to the customers because on the basis of the modular construction, the customer can do whatever they want with the internal uh, spaces. Highly customizable. It's all, it almost sits somewhere between housing, private housing delivery and people having the opportunity to enjoy the process of custom build. Um, I went down to visit Roll Along, who are based in Dorset, and, and have developed a really interesting um, partnership with an organization called 63,000 Homes. Now, Roll Along already supply uh, light steel framed offsite manufactured uh, units. They, they, they do housing projects in London, Particularly, they also are a major supplier to the MOD. They really pressed home to me that for them, standardization is absolutely key to being able to make the best of off-site manufacture. If you look at the cost base of off-site manufacture, um, it, it's difficult to see that it's particularly cheaper uh, than traditional manufacture. I read a report dating back to 2013, which was talking about the private volume house building industry and made the point that our industry in the UK has the most efficient, um, uh, has, some, has the most uh, efficient use of subcontracting and procurement in terms of traditional industry. And they thought it was probably some of the best that could be achieved throughout the developing countries. So, our private house builders are already incredibly effective at driving down the costs of house building. If you think that the actual cost of constructing a home is about 25% of the overall cost of the project, when you take into account uh, utilities and dealing with land preparation, marketing costs and, and everything else that goes into a building project, even if you can reduce the construction cost through modular construction by say 20%, it's only 20% of 25% of the project. And the point that's been made in reports is that for the private house building industry, those sorts of levels of savings are not necessarily going to drive them to um, significant use of off-site manufacture. I, I attended a presentation by Barrett Homes. They have um, a, a really interesting joint venture with a, an off-site manufacturer. They're, they're doing some fantastic stuff together, but Barrett's are saying, realistically, they would only ever expect to supply about 20% of their homes uh, using off-site technologies. And I just drift towards the high end. This is the, the German Huff House. They have a UK a market. One of these is built in Scotland. These are homes built to absolutely amazing environmental standards. Some of them are delivered as, as passive homes, require no um, heating systems. Uh, it just suggests to me that if people feel that off-site manufacture is utilitarian and dull uh, and monotone, then actually you have the ability to produce products that I think outstrip 
what we see delivered day to day in the UK market. And just go further afield, Japan has a burgeoning um, uh, off-site manufactured uh, market. A lot of the housing that they manufacture is, is high-end. It's for, 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 for wealthier people in Japan. But if you look at 2013, 13% of all their homes in Japan were of modular construction. And you've got companies like um, Sekisui House, 15,000 modular homes a year, knocking off 20 per day on their assembly lines. There's, n there's not a comparable um, position in the UK at present. So what can the public sector do, and particularly what can we do within the HCA? Well, um, the one thing that keeps coming back to me from the sector is it's all about the way we publicly procure. If, um, if we were to demand greater use of off-site manufacture when we sell sites uh, and when we offer opportunities for development, of course that would help build the industry. If we're going to directly commission homes ourselves and we can commit to off-site manufacture, that helps to generate a pipeline. When I visited Roll Along, I was hoping to do some interviews with the factory absolutely, you know, spinning off the units in the background. And actually, they're between contracts. So you got this significant factory sat there working on a skeleton staff waiting for their, their next big MOD uh, procurement to come into the factory. And any assembly line type production just cannot operate on the basis of that sort of stop start um, approach. Um, the government is intent on boosting the SME sector and a lot of the finance that we have um, been given to, to use to help boost private sector house building is going to have a particular emphasis on boosting delivery by small and medium sized um, contractors and developers. And what I have found is quite a large number of such companies seem to have quite an appetite for smaller scale developments but using off-site manufacture. So, so maybe it's a case of, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. The final point I want to make is, is both a good and bad thing, uh, design and environmental standards. Back in 2013, when an off-site review was written, it was full of absolute optimism that the whole sector was about to burst into flame. And it was all driven by the, the then government's um, move towards much higher environmental standards, and a desire to move to zero carbon housing. <coughs> um, the whole prospect in relation to off-site manufacture is that the much higher engineering standards uh, and the ability to produce a consistent quality in terms of the, the, the product absolutely lends itself to meeting higher environmental standards. If you look what's happened, I'm afraid the reality is that those standards have actually um, you know, been stepped away from. There's been some improvement in building regulation requirements that, 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 that perhaps helps uh, boost the sector a little. But if local authorities, when they um, uh, are providing planning consents, or if the HCA, when we are seeking to uh, release our, lo our own land assets, if, if we actually seek higher environmental standards that can only be good in terms of climate change impacts and, um, you know, the, the impact on future generations, I think that actually absolutely helps drive uh, the interest and uh, the support of off-site manufacture. I want to leave you with this. This, to me, is, a, is an image I've come across of... Um, an apartment block being built in New York. New York. Um, for me, the, ex the real excitement about this sector is the ability to see uh, new housing projects being delivered to site and actually getting into a, a wind and water tight condition in, 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 in days and weeks rather than months um, and to actually see a real acceleration in the pace at which we can build projects on the ground. Um, I'd be really pleased if anyone has a particular interest in modular construction or off-site manufacture, do please get in touch. We're trying to build a much stronger network 
of contacts within the agency. Uh, and as we start to promote and release land and holdings, uh, we, we really want to get it out there to, to all partners who may be able to help in supply. Thank you. Thank you.